Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel, and I'm the author and illustrator of these educational books right here. But before I begin talking about that at all, I actually have a secret that I'm going to share with all you guys. I hated reading when I was a kid. I completely hated reading. But it would actually be books that would help me. So here's a picture of me at seven years old. And I know I look like a gremlin before it gets wet. It's rough. And as you can see, I was always making things. I was a great artiste. But what I wasn't good at was reading. I struggled with reading so much that um, I was tested multiple times for dyslexia and other reading disorders. Um, I had exotropia, which is a really fancy way of saying I had a lazy eye. So every time I opened the book, I would get a huge migraine. It ended up I did not have any learning disorders. I was just not connecting with the materials in the way that my teachers expected me to. But then I discovered cartoons and comic books and super illustrated work like the ones behind me. And for the first time in my young life, I was having fun reading. And I felt like I was a smart kid. And that's when I realized that I could learn anything, no matter how complicated, as long as I approached it in my own way and that there was a ton of pictures. So today, I make the kind of artwork that helped me so much when I was a kid. Heavily illustrated educational infographics and books. And I actually get this question quite a, quite a bit, like, why so much science, Rachel? I have a background in illustration and graphic design. Why did I choose to become a science communicator? Well, to answer that question, let me show you the illustrations that actually started my career. So um, many, many years ago, I decided to draw these pictures about human anatomy because I found it fascinating. Like, everybody eats and poops. Who doesn't want to draw that? <laughs> but then I uh, got an email whoop, about this illustration right behind me, the respiratory system. And I got this email from this dad who had a four-year-old daughter with cystic fibrosis. And he emailed me to say, my daughter needs to use a respirator every night to go to sleep. And it freaks her out. But what frightens her even more are these very traditional images of human anatomy. But then I found your illustration online, and there's happy little lungs, and there's a little diaphragm that's like raising the roof, and I could actually trace the path that oxygen's taking throughout her body, and now she understands that the respirator is just there to make her lungs feel happy, and this has become a part of our nighttime routine. So he emailed me to thank me, and that's when I realized, hey, I have a special set of skills. I can take scientific research that's super complicated and dense and kind of dry sometimes, and I can make it fun and interesting to learn for anyone. I truly believe that illustration is one of the most powerful tools there is when it comes to education. Because when you take the time to organize complicated information and then take that extra step to make it beautiful, all of a sudden s people stop. You reach a whole new audience. They stop because it's pretty. And then before you know it, they go, they start reading all the little, the little side facts. And they're tricked into learning. They're all just like, whoa, I didn't expect I was going to do this today. Who knew? And that's what we have to keep doing. We have to keep tricking people into learning. Because it's only when people understand how history actually happened, understand how our world works, how our natural world works, can people then make informed decisions about everyday things. So as you could see, there was a ton of reasons why I decided to create this book. The wondrous workings of planet Earth, understanding our world and its ecosystems. But one of the main reasons is I know that the biggest problem that we face is an overuse of our natural resources and climate change. But before we can even begin to talk about that, we need to make sure that every single person has a basic understanding of ecology, of earth science, of what biodiversity is, why it's important, of what an ecosystem actually is. Well, an ecosystem, for those who don't know, is the interactions between living things and each other, and those living things and their environment. And it's only through that interaction between plants and animals, predator and prey, life and death, is planet Earth a place that human beings can call home? So let me just give you two quick examples. Let's zoom into the soil. 
There's a bunch of bugs and bacteria and fungi. And what are they doing? They're just living life. They're eating dead things. They're eating some poop. And the result is, surprise, nutrient-rich soil that we can actually grow our crops in. Or let's zoom out to the Congo rainforest in Africa, where there's so many plants in one place that they actually create their own weather systems. Um, there are more thunderstorms in the Congo than anywhere else on Earth, and they create rainfall for all of Northern Africa. But of course, rainforests do a lot more than just make rain. They provide 30% of our oxygen in our atmosphere. So that means right here in Missouri, you're probably breathing in oxygen molecules made by a plant on the other side of the world. And that's why the natural world is important even if you don't ever go to visit it all over the world. And that's why in this book, I talk about ecology all over the world, from the Great Plains to our deepest oceans. And I discuss why are these ecosystems important? How do they benefit human beings? And I also talk about what is the greatest impact we're having on these places. Why, why are they under threat? And what is the biggest threat that they face? So before I was done, and before I knew it, I accidentally created a whole textbook. Uh, yeah, I talk about the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, all those really cool topics that really get you excited, you know? But I assure you, this book is not as dull as a textbook. It's filled with a bunch of silly stories. It's filled with, a, filled with a ton of fun facts. And by the time you're done, you're gonna have your own, whole new, own favorite animal. And I'm actually gonna share my favorite animal with you guys right here, the mighty velvet worm. There are three reasons why I love the velvet worm. One, it's older than dirt. As a species, they predate insects. Two, when, they, when they're attacking their prey, they shoot goo out of their face. I mean, come on. And three, three, did you know that they're a matriarch? They're led by their eldest female. God bless those worms. <laughs> and all of this sounds really silly and really funny, but it's actually these like kind of pieces of trivia and these silly facts that really engage children. And I'm gonna actually tell you a very, very quick story about that. So I'm giving a talk about my women in books at a local elementary school. And a mom and her kid comes up to me. And the little kid, she's like seven years old, she's literally using her mom as a meat shield. And they're like, you know, you're like one of our favorite authors. We love reading your book. My daughter's a big fan. And the, you know, she's just quivering behind her mom. And then her mom goes, you know, Rachel's next book is all about plants and animals and planet Earth. And then the seven-year-old literally jumps in front of her mom, gets in my face, and at the top of her lung yells, did you know that wombats poop cubes? Can that be in your book? And then proceeds to tell me all about poop, wombats, marsupials, Australia. And that is the power that silly trivia has. It, all of a sudden, it gives people and kids the confidence to feel like, they could teach the teacher that they're an expert in a field, and it allows them to really sink their teeth into the information. And that's really what we're trying to do with nonfiction, and um, especially children's nonfiction, is giving, those, giving kids the self-esteem to be excited about learning and also be excited about teaching others. So as you can see, there are a ton of reasons why I wanted to make this book. But the reason I decided to put a theme of conservation on each and every page is because of the lessons I learned while researching my first book, Women in Science. And in this book, I talk about conservationists like Rachel Carson and Jane Goodall and Sylvia Earle. And I was just so moved on how they took their research, showed that research to the public, and then were able to uh, affect the opinions of people in positions of power to make real change. And I'm going to just share one of those stories with you right now about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. So Marjorie was working in the 1940s, and her job was to survey the Everglades, which at the time, everyone was like, this is a disgusting swamp. We need to drain it. It is gross. And you know what? I've been there. It is gross. I was like covered in mosquito bites by the time I was done. And you know what? Marjorie also agreed. She described it as no place for a picnic, way too buggy, way too wet. But it was while she was researching that she realized that, hey, this isn't a swamp at all. This is actually a moving river of grass. And it's a river that connects to 
other important ecosystems in Florida, including the mangrove forests. So for those who don't know who mangrove, what mangroves are, mangroves are these trees that are all along the coast of Florida. And they have these super dense, complicated root systems that literally keep the shore in place and protects Florida from hurricanes. And it does a lot more than that. Fish lay their eggs there, and then the baby fish are like, hey, this is really safe. I'm going to grow up and become a teen fish, and then I'm going to go into the ocean. So it's actually also vital to our fisheries in the ocean that the mangroves are preserved. And they're super important for people, too. Like, no one wants to get blown away by a hurricane and lose their beaches. So that means that, surprise, the moving river of grass, the Everglades, is also super important. So she writes a book about it, the book gets published, and it becomes a national park. But her work's not done yet. 20 years later, at the age of 80, she has to protect the Everglades again. The US Army Corps of Engineers wants to put an airport smack in the middle of it, just pour concrete all over the whole thing. And she's like, no, we can't do this. So she organizes a petition. She, she goes and protests. She gets in front of her local governments and explains to them the importance of maintaining sheet flow, the movement of the water. And they listen to her, and they decide to build the airport someplace else. And then at the age of 103, she's awarded the Presidential, Presidential Medal of Freedom for just protecting Florida's ecosystems. And wow, what a life, you know, 103. But there are two, two really important lessons that I personally learned from her story. One, we cannot terraform our entire planet for human comfort. And it does not benefit us to do so. We cannot live in a giant cheesecake factory, guys. I'm sorry. And two, we choose how we build. And it's an active choice that we are making constantly. And we could choose to keep nature in mind and, and, and build responsibly, or we could choose not to. So in this book, I don't just talk about plants and animals. I talk about people. I talk about how we build, how we farm, and I talk about our growing population. And as our population grows, so does our need for food, shelter, and fuel. And the only way we're going to continue to build responsibly is if we really understand the impact that we are having on our ecosystems. And so that means that I talk about one of the greatest impacts that we have, the constant pollution of carbon into our atmosphere. So in this book, we also talk about climate change. As I was researching this book, I was overwhelmed how almost each and every ecosystem was hugely impacted by climate change and how the evidence was all around us. Whether it's the bleaching of our coral reefs, or the loss of cold weather habitats, and we are actually seeing millions of animals migrate north and migrate further up mountains just to find a habitat that they could live in. Or maybe it's the fact that and, uh, you know, icebergs the size of Delaware are breaking off from our, from our ice caps. Or maybe it's even closer to home. Maybe it's the fact that my, in, in my home beach in New Jersey, there is now a hurricane watch season where there never was before. So the evidence is all around us. And that begs us to question, why are there still people who deny that climate change is real? Well, there's a lot of answers to that, but I think one of the main answers is fear. Climate change is scary. It is going to change our planet in ways that we cannot predict, and it's going to affect our lives and our children's lives in ways that we cannot predict. And that's frightening. But just like how learning about a chronic illness can feel stressful, and, and just overwhelming. Education is the first step. And like I said before, I think illustration can be a powerful tool in educating the public. And I have seen firsthand how illustration can be used to talk about scary and complicated subjects. So maybe just like how putting a pair of happy face on, a, on some lungs can help a young girl with cystic fibrosis understand what's going on in her body. Illustration can be a part of the arsenal of tools that we have to help everyone understand what's going on in our world. My biggest hope for this book is that it doesn't just get people excited to learn about our planet, but it also gets people feeling empowered to, to try and protect it. And when I say empowered, 
I really mean that because it's going to take a lot more than recycling in our own homes to, you know, preserve our natural resources and prevent climate change. It's going to take us looking at where we have power and then flexing that power. Is it in your school? Is it in the place that you work? Maybe it's just you showing up to vote. There's a lot of ways that we can help make change. And here are a couple organizations that can really push you in the right direction and help you along that journey. So I'm actually going to end this talk with a quote by Jane Goodall, which is kind of the main motivation for me to do this entire project. Only if we understand will we care, only if we care will we help, and only if we help will we all be saved. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.